Hi, my name is Neil French. Uh, I've had my OM1 now for a little over a year, as the title says, and I've probably taken about 100,000 images with it. And uh, as a long time Olympus user, and now using the OM1 for over a year, I've, I've used it intensively in uh, Kenya for, for three weeks. We went on safari, and I've used it for a month in uh, Panama, where we shot birds on different, uh, very difficult conditions sometimes. So, I believe I've gotten to know my camera really, really well, and uh, so I thought that I would uh, just share my experience with this camera after a year. Now, uh, one of the things I love about it, right, what you see right now is my own one with a 300 f4 with a tel converter. I have a reach of uh, uh, 840 40 millimeters that I can just portable take with me wherever I want to go, and uh, uh, works really, really well. So I'm going to concentrate on, on action wildlife uh, photography. Uh, it's not going to do plane trains or automobiles. I don't shoot people very often. And so uh, if you're interested in finding out more about this camera for those uses, stay tuned. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm not going to walk around with a camera pointing at things and saying this is what I do. I'm going to show images on my computer and uh, those images I'm going to use to show you how I believe you can use the camera to the maximum of its ability. So if you're interested in and hearing my opinion of the camera, stay tuned. When it comes to build of the OM-1, anybody who knows anything about Olympus cameras know that they're very well built and, and the weather ceiling is really good. And this image was taken in uh, Savo East in Africa and you can see the elephant, they, they're actually turning red from the red dust of the soil. Everything gets covered with this fine dust. So the, I've used this camera in very dusty conditions. This picture is in Panama. Um, we walked for maybe a couple hours in, in steady drizzle, not really hard rain, but steady drizzle. I just throw the camera over my shoulder and, and away I go. So uh, I've used this camera in, in wet conditions. Uh, in Panama, it was also pretty warm in a lot of places, so uh, lots of daytime averages were around the mid-30s with fairly high humidity. One day actually hit 38 degrees, so I've used it in hot, humid conditions. And of course, I'm from Canada, so uh, in Canada it does get cold. So you look at this image uh, of the moose and you can see its breath, and so you know it was a little bit cold. So yes, I've used this camera in, in cold conditions. So again, I've, I think my camera is a tool. I don't want to have to uh, pack it away in, in the rain or the dust. I want it to be always available to be used, and, and that's one of the things I like about this camera. Okay, when it comes to ergonomics, uh, again, if you've used an uh, Olympus camera, the OM-1 will be very, very similar. Uh, it's got a nice deep grip in here. It uh, feels very comfortable in the hand. Some people want to put uh, a grip on it. I certainly see no reason for a grip. I have pretty normal hands, uh, certainly not small, and I have no problem with the grip on this camera. It's, it's very, very comfortable. Uh, having said that, there's only one thing I'm really going to talk about with the ergonomics. This is my EM-1 Mark II, and you see where the dials were on this camera? And uh, they did change where the dials uh, go. So on the OM-1, they, they took this front dial, moved it away from the shutter button, and moved it down here, and there's this lip on the front of the camera. And uh, it did take me a little while to get used to that. Uh, of course, being used to the old camera, the first thing I'd do is I'd look for the dial. It wasn't there. I'd come down here. But this is where I would run my finger across the, the front of, of this, um, where it sticks out, and I, I would actually take it away from my eye so I could get my finger on that dial. Uh, I'm used to the camera now. I, I've used it for over a year, and so now it's automatic. My finger will come here. I feel this little lump. I'll go over top of it, and I'll find that dial. Some people have uh, said the dial is a little bit stiff. Mine certainly isn't. Uh, the buttons I find in this camera are also a little bit smaller than they are in the old camera. And so what I will say with this one is you need to be deliberate uh, about pressing buttons to make sure that they're pressed. And you, well, I, actually I'm now used to it. I just deliberately push my finger over the top and get in this little uh, valley or whatever you want to call it and turn that dial. Some people say it's difficult to use with gloves. As I pointed out, I'm from Canada and I've definitely used this with uh, gloves on lots of times. Now, uh, a couple other things, the, the new viewfinder, viewfinder, especially with uh, blackout-free shooting, is, is 
just wonderful when it comes to trying to shoot uh, flying birds. So that's that's an improvement, uh, very very welcome. And uh, the other one is the menu has changed. And I was used to the old menu, so I didn't have any difficulty with the old menu. But boy. Uh, it didn't take me very long to learn a new menu, so I'm going to say somebody coming from another camera system, this probably is a big improvement and it'll make it much easier for them. When I bought the OM-1, uh, I wanted improved autofocus and high ISO performance. And uh, after I got the camera, I discovered probably the most important uh, component of the new camera was the speed. So I'm shooting with SH2. I've turned it down to 25 frames a second. I feel that's fast enough. I seem to be getting the pictures that I want consistently. Uh, some people will argue that's uh, prey and spray photography. I'm going to say that it's uh, choosing using a tool to the best of its advantage. And I'm going to use some pictures here to show you. Now I've got a white-throated bee eater that we shot in Kenya in Africa and I'm going to go through some pictures realize that I have both JPEGs and and ORFs here uh, raw files and so we got him at just as he was taking off it's not a bad picture uh, just show I, I didn't clean this one up but you can just I cropped it and lightened it a little bit so if I didn't get another picture I would probably be satisfied with that uh, this was the next picture this is the next picture next picture next picture and then I got this picture and the wings are fully extended you can almost see right through the wings his tail feathers are are spread out and and so a beautiful picture of a white throated bee eater and so that's one shot and just show you and, and he was gone uh, he they go pretty fast he was out of my field of view so I've got one picture that I really really wanted so uh, I wouldn't have got that with anything less than 25 frames a second now I'm going to take you to an even more extreme example. And I need to go to the folder where he comes from so that I can show you properly. And uh, so this is a Malachite Kingfisher. And he was perched. And he's getting ready to take off. And so this is when he takes off. This is a first picture. Now this is a picture that's cropped and, and brightened and fixed up. And again, wings fully extended. And, and the Malachite Kingfisher is really tiny, a really beautiful little Kingfisher. And he is like a little rocket when he takes off. So I got one picture when he, when he left that branch. Uh, that's the second picture. And uh, my wife with her Sony a7R4, she was shooting at 10 frames a second. Uh, she got one picture. This was about what hers looked like. So, you know, if you didn't get another picture, I guess you'd have to be satisfied with that. But um, one more picture, and then he was gone out of my field of view. Um, he took off like a little rocket. And so, again, um, three pictures, and really only one uh, that, I, that I really, really wanted. So uh, 25 frames a second takes luck out of it. I could maybe get this at 10 frames a second if I got lucky. But I don't have to be lucky anymore. I can consistently get the pictures that I want. So I, I find that speed to be just really, really important. And I'm just going to show you uh, an example of, of stationary birds or perch birds. Uh, there's no such thing as a stationary bird. And again, I'm going to go full screen. So this is a wren thrush. This was in Panama. This bird is only found in the highlands of Panama and Costa Rica and only in the, the cloud forest. It was actually raining when we were there. So this is a relatively rare bird that I'm probably never going to see again in my life. And so uh, I have a picture with his mouth closed. So I just started with his mouth open. So he's, he opens a little more. Not bad. Um, not bad. And that's the one with his mouth fully open. And then next picture, his mouth is closed. So I have one picture with his mouth open. And so this is it fixed up, uh, fully open, his crest showing really, really well, and, and a, a beautiful picture of uh, a, a wren thrush, a relatively rare bird that I'm probably never going to see again in my lifetime. Now, one final note here, uh, what I'm showing with this picture, of course, you have to shoot uh, electronic shutter to get 25 frames a second. And uh, you can see this bird, uh, it, I didn't clean it up, it's grainy. But uh, the bird is rel itself is relatively sharp, but look at the wings. 
Now, some people say, okay, well, that's shutter speed. Well, that accounts for the blur in the wings, and I don't mind that, but it doesn't account for this warping. So this is rolling shutter. Now, this particular bird was leaving the feeder, and as they leave the feeder, they that's when they accelerate. That's when their wing beat is the fastest, and hummingbirds have a really, really fast uh, wing beat. So I've probably shot over a 1,000 pictures of hummingbirds, and... Uh, Hummingbirds are the only place I have seen rolling shutter like this. So I just point out that you can get rolling shutter, but it is definitely not a problem with this camera. It's, it's only, only in extreme circumstances that you'll see it. Okay, the big topic uh, for the OM-1 is the autofocus. And uh, am I satisfied? Uh, yes, I am, but there are some things that you do need to know about it. It is vastly improved. But you really do need to set this camera up for yourself and, and your shooting conditions. So uh, this, is, this is a very sophisticated camera and, and you need to have it the way you want it. Now I'll start by saying all my custom functions are, are being used for different settings. Just going to talk about C1 uh, which is for uh, perch birds and C2 for flying birds. So I'll talk about those a little bit. Uh, so talk about my buttons first. My shutter button has been set so all it does is release the shutter. It does not initiate autofocus. Uh, the new camera has an autofocus on button. This is back button focus, whatever you want to call it. This is the only button that initiates focus on my camera. Uh, just find it works with much better. If you've, if you've done that before, uh, you probably agree with me. The next button that I set, I set this AEL to uh, turn subject detection on and off. You have to have a button to be able to turn it on and off quickly. I'm going to point out why in a little bit. So I've set it to this button and, and turn it on and off uh, really, really quickly. Uh, the other thing that I've done is this uh, function lever. We have a one, two function leader, lever. In function, for my C1, for perch birds, in position one, it's all points active. So all the focus points are active. Uh, position two, one point is active. So I go from full, all points active, to one point active. And some people might say that's a little extreme and, and you may not want to do that. You might want to use for position one something a little bit bigger, And I'm, but I'm going to explain why I do what I do. Then when I'm in C2 and I'm flying birds, position one is again, all points active. I, I use that 99% of the time. Position two takes me down to a, a smaller 5x5 five five focusing area, and that's just in case there's more than one bird. I don't go to a single point because you can never keep a single point on a flying bird. It, it's virtually impossible. So you need to set the camera up uh, the way you want to set it up. Now, j just a, a note, like you can press the joystick here and turn the dial and you can select different uh, focus areas just by turning the dial but I want to be able to change it quickly so again my thumb moves around here all the time and it just flicks that button and and uh, goes from one position to the next and I'll I'll show you why with some pictures so the autofocus system uh, start out with uh, subject detection you can no longer separate subject detection from the autofocus system they like they work together and it's part of the same so you need to talk about them together so we were so close to this lion that i'm shooting with my 300 f4 with a teleconverter on and this is uncropped it's all i could fit in i uh, actually ended up with what i feel is a decent portrait um camera selected a line put a box around the eye autofocus no problem so subject detection on animal detection on now, this was an interesting one. Uh, lions and, and cheetahs will stick around. You can take as many pictures as you want, but leopards are shy. So we were driving along looking for birds. I had my camera set for bird detection autofocus. And uh, one of the complaints from some people is that for some other camera system, you select one, like animal detection, and, and it will select birds. You don't have to switch between birds and animals. It, the camera does it. And I say, well, what if you're shooting birds and, and a leopard jumps out? Well, okay, so we were driving along. Uh, this leopard was on this rock. Our driver saw it, hit the brakes, backed up really, really quickly. We got to fire off a few shots, and then he jumped up and ran away. Uh, they don't stick around. 
Uh, he was close enough. It's cropped top and bottom, but it's not cropped on the side. So he was pretty close. And so with bird detection autofocus, it drew a box around the leopard and a box around the eye and autofocus is, is perfectly on, on the leopard. So what happens if you're doing bird autofocus and a leopard jumps out, point your camera at him, take a picture. The autofocus will grab him. This is a dog-like creature, a black -back jackal. And uh, again, the camera selected the animal. Uh, box around the eye, no problem at all. Autofocus worked great. Okay, this is where it fell apart. So this is a rhino and, and the baby, and, and I'm just going to show what my wife got with her A7R4, a tack sharp image. So with this one here, when the animal was running, some of the images were sharp, some were not. Turned, this is a picture I wanted, and it the camera missed. So when we were shooting uh, antelope, deer-like creatures it would be hit and miss it seemed when they're moving faster the camera actually worked better uh, stationary ones though sometimes they were sharp and sometimes they weren't so i attended an online seminar and and the spokesman for the company says that the animal detection has been fine-tuned for cats and dogs uh, temper your expectations for other animals and uh, when we were in africa i had my 40 to 150 on my em1 mark ii uh, and lots of times elephants and giraffes were too big and I had to switch to that camera. No subject detection. Every one of those images is tack sharp. So my recommendation is if uh, you're shooting anything besides something that looks like a cat or a dog, turn uh, subject detection off. Just hit that button. Um, in Canada, I've also had problems with elk uh, with uh, subject detection. So turn it off. The camera autofocus is excellent and you're very, very likely to get a picture that looks exactly like this. Uh, the, the camera, the focus is fast and accurate. Put a box on that uh, Rhino and, and your camera is gonna focus without subject detection. We become dependent on technology and expect, well, okay, this is a new feature. I have to use it. No, you don't. The camera will work without it. Now where the camera really shines is, is for birds and the first picture I'm showing you is out of focus. Well, um, it works really, really well, but I need to point something out. Uh, my EM1 Mark II and busy backgrounds tended to go to the back, background in here. The OM1 tends to front focus on distractions in front of the bird. Uh, so you just need to be aware of that. And so for a, an image like this, and I'll, I'll go to the next one. And so same burst, the bird is tack sharp. So in a case like this, what you need to do is you need to flick that lever and go to single point active. So only one point and you need to put it up here somewhere on the bird. Doesn't have to be on the eye. You just have to catch the bird. The subject detection can then be on and it will capture the bird and draw a box around the eye. Um, but you need to single point. You might argue, some people might argue, well, if you were using a smaller box like five by five, well, I have found that if it that box goes here and if there's pr they're pretty close and it can be difficult to know whether it's tack sharp through the viewfinder. So when you're in a busy foreground like this, you need to go to, uh, in my opinion, you need to go to single point and then you can be confident that it's going to catch the bird. Now, just uh, another thing that I have learned or what works for me is uh, I told you I have that autofocus on. So when I'm shooting a bird like this, if he sticks around long enough for me, I will put that point on him, but then I will uh, do a quick burst and I'll let go of the autofocus on button and the shutter button. And then I will repress the autofocus on just in case I had caught a branch in front of the bird and it wasn't, the bird isn't tack sharp. If you do that several times, uh, chances are pretty good that you're going to be getting a, a sharp picture of a bird. So again, some people claim that's a failure of the camera. It should be able to just see a bird from, a small bird from 200 meters away in thick brush. And uh, you're going to be disappointed if that's your expectation. The camera works fine. You just have to know how to work with it. Now, this is a picture. There were brush all around the scene here. So it was like uh, shooting through a tunnel. Um, this is a golden-throated uh, uh, mannequin. Uh, we got him in Panama. So it's like all these branches around him. 
And did the camera work? Uh, you bet. A tack sharp image. And this one I had all points active. There is nothing directly in front of the bird. So the camera immediately grabbed the bird, drew a box around the eye, and, and you can see I have a tack sharp image. This is why uh, e I, even for perched birds, I use all points active because if the camera can clearly see the bird, it will grab that faster than you can grab it, faster than you can move that joystick. And so that's the key with this. Can the camera see the bird? And if it sees the bird, then all points active will work just fine. So what about flying birds? Well, actually, this is where the camera really, really shines. So uh, hummingbirds are really fast. Anybody who knows about hummingbirds, they're really, really fast. Uh, I shoot 1 2500th of a second. Uh, I try to get them just as they approach the flower. The bird will be quite still. You can see the bird is nice and sharp. You will not freeze the wings at 1 2500th of a second, but I'm okay with that. It kind of shows motion a little bit. So I kind of like that. Uh, so that's the way I shoot. And just showing you another hummingbird. This is a scintillant hummingbird, one of the smallest birds in the world. Uh, he weighs about two grams. Camera grabbed him, no problem. This is the female coming right at the camera, grabbed him, no problem. Um, this is a snowy belly, again, hummingbird, and, and grabbed him without any problem. So flying birds is where the camera really, really shines and works really, really well. And just more of the same and just, showing you how well it works for flying birds. And I use hummingbirds just because they are a tough subject to try and catch like this. Okay, I am going to go to uh, show you a, a series now, though. I, I think it's important that we, we look at this. So um, just back up there. So we were shooting flamingos. There were thousands of them on this lake where we were. So shooting flamingos, and, and as I say, I always look behind you. So I turned around and in the the land cruiser and looked out the other window and lo and behold uh, there's a pied kingfisher flying at me and I'm gonna put this full screen and I'm gonna just go through a series and I'm gonna go through fairly quickly so he started out flying right at me and I turned the camera and the camera grabbed them almost immediately now what I want you to look at some of the pictures as we go I was having trouble keeping up with them um, some of this might be shutter speed. I was at 1 2500th of a second. Uh, just show that one. A really nice picture, great reflection. Uh, he wasn't sharp. And so going to make a point about that. And uh, you can see that as I go along, and this is a picture that I chose, uh, and I feel a, a good, really good picture of a pied kingfisher. I was really hoping he was going to dip into the water and, and catch a fish. He was skimming along, you know, really close to the water, but that didn't happen for us. My biggest challenge was to keep him in, in my field of view. And uh, so just want to point out, I, I took 49 images here. And 25 frames a second, that means that was two seconds of action. It happened really, really fast. And if I was to look at this out of 49 image, there might be a half a dozen that are not tack sharp. Some of that might be shutter speed, but I do want to point out that, uh, and, and other people that have reviewed the camera have pretty much said the same thing. This camera, you might lose an image or two in the middle, but the fortunate thing of this is it will recover. With my EM1 Mark II, if the first image was not in focus, none of the images were in focus. Uh, if you lost it halfway through a burst, then from that point on, it, it could not recover. The OM-1 will recover. You will have one image that's not sharp, and the very next one is, is tack sharp. So it, it can lose focus for a fraction of a second, but it will quickly regain focus. So that's shooting at 25 frames a second. And this improved autofocus system, again, I, I'm consistently, luck is no longer involved. I'm consistently getting the images that I want. So the, the autofocus system is, is drastically improved, and is particularly for birds and particularly for flying birds. Okay, when it comes to image quality with the OM-1, it's still a 20 megapixel sensor. I do believe it captures a little bit more detail, but uh, that's pretty hard to prove with a 
So the, the, there's probably not a significance at ISO 200. When it comes to high ISO performance, though, I've, I've got some pictures. This is with my EM1 Mark II, and you can see it's ISO 5000. So the first one is with my old camera. The next images I'm going to show, uh, 12,800 with the OM1, 12,800 with the OM1, and again, 12,800 with the OM1. So I'm uh, going to come back to this and i and, uh, going to go full screen so you can see it a little bit better. Now, when the OM1 came out, there was the company made some bold claims, and there almost seemed to be some people on the internet who quoted charts and and almost seemed to take take pleasure in saying the company was lying about the performance of the camera. Uh, it was just as noisy as the old one. Well, um, what I will tell you is I have lots of experience now with it in the field. I don't shoot charts; I shoot real subjects in the field, and this is my observations. So the old camera at ISO 5000, uh, noise is a non-issue, and that's the first thing. Uh, is it just as noisy as the old one? Possibly. Who cares? Uh, I can easily remove the noise. Uh, you can see that with the old camera, this this image has no noise left in it. Uh, I reprocess reprocess it with. Uh, uh, Topaz AI uh, software so it just recently so that it's got the same treatment as my other pictures. So what is the difference? If you look in the feathers here and you see the feather detail, uh, there, it's not bad. This is not a bad picture, but the, the feathers are starting to blur a little bit. We're losing some of the detail in the feathers with the old camera at ISO 5000. Uh, come to the new camera, and this is 12,800, and uh, even a flying bird. So I just threw this one in. I want to show a flying bird is capturing more detail than the old camera used to capture. So noise, non-issue, completely removed. So how well does it retain detail, and how true to the colors? You start to lose colors and get weird color casts at higher ISOs. At 12,800, no problem with the OM1. Now, I've shown this picture before, and again, ISO 12,800, extremely difficult uh, conditions. We were chasing a relatively small bird uh, in thick forest in the rain, and uh, I did manage to get my picture, but I had to have my ISO at 12,800. Uh, I also want to point out one other thing. Uh, often, Micro Four Thirds is criticized for not having uh, narrow depth of field. Full frame, I can isolate my subject better. Just want to point out that in the original, uh, the leaves and the branches, especially in front of the face, were more distracting. One of the things you can't do is tell a bird where to go. He goes where he is, and we have to try and capture the picture. So what I did was take it into Photoshop, uh, used uh, subject detection AI, it selected bird perfectly then I just added this moss to that selection inverse the selection and then I applied a blur to the background and so I can get as much blur in my background of my pictures as you can with a full frame camera so uh, I don't consider that to be a problem for micro four thirds in fact this one I didn't have to blur the background because it was far away but with an image like this uh, again very low light we're using an f4 lens uh, I can't imagine using an f8 like some lenses now are, are have a maximum or minimum aperture of, of f8. Uh, my wife with her two, Sony 200 to 600, that's a fantastic lens, but it's a 6.3. Her ISOs were at least double mine. So this is ISO 12,800. I can take a picture of it at f4, and the head and the tail are sharp. If you're using a full frame uh, sensor at f4, you could get the head, but you would be blurring by the time you got to the back end of the bird. So you couldn't get the whole bird, whereas I can uh, with my increased depth of field. Um, now, I'm just going to zoom in here. So uh, just to show 12,800 and plenty of detail with the Micro Four Thirds sensor. Who would have thought 12,800 with a Micro Four Thirds sensor? Uh, just going to show two more pictures real quickly just to emphasize the point. Uh, this picture, again, you can't tell the birds where to go. They, you have to take them where they are. And this branch in front of the face, and uh, there's a lot of distractions, this bright leaf. So all you do is you take it over into Photoshop. I dim the, the, the leaf in the front. Uh, I selected the bird and, and then, then inversed it, took the background, and I blurred it. So that branch now is blurred and this bird uh, pops out and it's just like it would with a full frame sensor. 
And the uh, fact is, is I had blurred the background more till it was pretty much just color. So you could see the green in the background. Uh, my son said, actually, I want to know that it's in a jungle. And so, in fact, I, I took off some of the blur. And so that's just the thing. Uh, the whole bird is sharp. In the background, I can decide how much blur I want to apply to it. So uh, again, um, ISO 12800, did I get the performance? I am just delighted with the uh, high ISO performance of this Micro Four Third sensor. So it really, really helps to get uh, these kind of photographs in very, very tough conditions. So just to wrap up this video, uh, again, uh, Olympus has always been a great travel camera. Uh, portable, put it into a backpack with, with a number of lenses and, and away you go. And uh, so it's always served that purpose. Now with the improved autofocus, uh, with the improved high ISO performance and that pure speed that it has, it's a more complete camera. And I'm finding it's just, it's fun to use and I'm getting the images that I want to collect. Now again, I've concentrated on uh, wildlife uh, photography for this, action photography, fast photography. I believe that's what the camera is really built for, meant for. Having said that, uh, I've uh, included a link to uh, my website uh, for myself and my wife. Uh, we love to travel and uh, we've gone to a lot of different places and so we do shoot a lot more than just wildlife. Um, We've been lucky enough to travel through Europe, even into Eastern Europe, into Croatia and Romania, travel through Asia, uh, been to the Forbidden City in China, and been to Angkor Wat in, in Cambodia. And uh, so if you're interested in some of those pictures, Machu Picchu in South America, uh, just go have a look at our website and you'll see we do those. I do a little bit of night photography, a few pictures in there. And there are pictures from Canada, where I am from, and uh, the Rocky Mountains, if you're interested in some of those and uh, a trip to the Great Bear Rainforest, uh, not with my own one before I bought my own one. So if you're interested in some of those, uh, just take a click on the link and go have a look at our website. Uh, I hope this video helps you to know the OM1 a little bit better. I would highly recommend the camera if you're considering it. Uh, I hope that some of the pointers that maybe I've given will help you with your photography. Thanks for watching.